When horror fans talk about the best times for the genre in film, you usually hear about the innovation of the 60s, the subversive auteur push of the 70s, and the heyday of the 80s. Each of these decades brought genre-defining films, cult classics, and creators that helped shape the genre. The 1990s, on the other hand, is a different story. When people talk about horror in the 90s, you'll often hear the decade referred to as a low point in history, a time where great horror movies were few and far between, and the genre lacked direction. It's a decade that, beyond a few distinct classics, is skipped over when it comes to being a horror fan. But why? What gave the decade this reputation? What are the hidden gems of this supposed low point in horror movies? And what was the lasting impact of the 1990s on the genre? This is a look at horror on film in a time of change, and an attempt to answer the question, was horror in the 90s really that bad? If the 90s were a rough time for horror on the big screen, it didn't simply start at the turn of the decade. Really, all you have to look to is 1989 for the roots of the issue. The 80s were a huge time in horror, and while there were plenty of fantastic one-off films during the decade, it was also defined by successful franchises that kept fans coming back for near yearly installments. 1989, however, was not good for franchise horror. Just take a look at this. Halloween 5, Jason Takes Manhattan, The Dream Child, Ghostbusters 2, The Fly 2, Sleepaway Camp 3, Bride of Reanimator. Even if you like some of these films, no judgment. Okay, a little judgment. They were all major financial disappointments aside from Ghostbusters 2. In the wake of the money drying up after the second wave of the slasher boom went bust, the titans of horror were dying. Nightmare, Halloween, and Friday the 13th would all have more entries in the 90s, but not nearly at the rate they were made in the 80s. The heir apparent to these icons, the Child's Play series, put out sequels in 1991 and 1992 before stalling and returning for Bride of Chucky in 1998. Way too little to define the decade. Secondary horror series like Hellraiser and Return of the Living Dead would turn into direct-to-video franchises, all made for cheap in hopes of turning a quick buck. And as we'll see, most horror hits that started in the 90s themselves were almost all turned into straight-to-video sequels when franchised. Tentpool mainstream recognition in horror isn't necessary to make a truly great movie, but when horror movies consistently bring in big box office returns, movie studios become more likely to greenlight more horror movies with sizable budgets. Let's face it, every artist works within the confines of a studio system to some degree, and studios work within the confines of what box offices dictate. If audiences flock to horror movies, the studios make horror. If audiences demand superhero movies, the studios make another superhero movie. The horror hangover majorly hit the box office in 1989, and that continued on throughout the following years that defined the early 90s, as it became harder and harder to jumpstart the genre in the mainstream again. Alongside the death of the horror franchise, the 90s saw many of the most influential horror directors on the downslope of their careers. George A. Romero, whose Dead trilogy created the zombie movie, directed two feature films and a short, but could barely get a film greenlit after being associated for years with zombies, who were completely passe in the 90s. Toby Hooper, who helped kickstart the modern auteurist wave of horror with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and reached the commercial high point of his career alongside Steven Spielberg with Poltergeist in 1982, made three movies in the 90s, each pretty terrible. Stuart Gordon, he of Reanimator and From Beyond made Castle Freak, I guess. John Carpenter, who shaped modern horror with Halloween and went on a hot streak throughout the 80s, came back from a hiatus with the disastrous Memoirs of an Invisible Man. Besides In the Mouth of Madness in 1994, the 90s were the permanent decline of Carpenter. Sam Raimi, who had broken into film with The Evil Dead and cemented himself with Evil Dead 2, quickly distanced himself from horror with superhero, comedy, western, and prestige dramas. David Cronenberg also distanced himself from horror with psychological dramas like Naked Lunch and Crash. Even David Lynch, whose works could be best described as horror-adjacent, made his most conventional film with The Straight Story. Dario Argento, once a leading voice in Giallo, well, completely fell apart. 
Most disappointing of all was Clive Barker, who came roaring onto the horror scene in the second half of the 80s as a triple threat of novelist, screenwriter, and director, and fully solidified with one of the great movies for dang-ass freaks, Hellraiser in 1987, basically had his directing career destroyed with the disastrous Nightbreed in 1990 and forgettable Lord of Illusions in 95. Candyman in 92 would be based on Barker's The Forbidden, keeping him in the horror conversation, but he was largely removed from the movies that would later adapt his work. The only master of horror that would find success in the 90s was, at the time, maybe seen as a surprise. Wes Craven, whose career in the 80s was marked by more misses than hits, began to turn things around in 91 with The People Under the Stairs, and then the meta returned to Freddy with New Nightmare in 94. Craven's resurgence opened the door to Scream, using Kevin Williamson's horror-conscious and extremely timely script, going on to make $173 million and suddenly revolutionizing horror. You can't talk about horror in the 90s without talking about Scream, which we will in a moment. But what it highlights here is that among so many horror greats, Craven was really the only one to succeed in the last decade of the 20th century. With so many legacy directors falling flat, what new voices stepped up to take their place? The answer is, well, not really anyone. Guillermo del Toro had the independent Mexican film Kronos and the contentiously made American Mimic, but nothing else yet. Paul W.S. Anderson made Event Horizon, but wouldn't make more horror until the 2000s. Resident December Evil Baby. Tim Burton, however, who I consider to be more interested in the aesthetics of horror than truly making a horror movie most of the time, dove deeper into the genre during the decade, with Ed Wood, my favorite movie of his, focusing on the real-life career of a horror director. Batman Returns having the most horror elements of any Dark Knight movie, and Sleepy Hollow being his most outright scary film. Overall, 90s horror was largely cobbled together by a combination of less acclaimed creators keeping low-budget franchises going, and more influential auteurs dabbling in the genre for a picture or two. I think when people say that horror sucked in the 90s, it's mostly because there's just not that many standout films per year. Combine that with a parade of disappointing sequels and adaptations, and you get the reputation. Jason Goes to Hell, Freddy's Dead, Body Snatchers, Phantasm 3 kinda but definitely Phantasm 4, Species 2, Halloween 6, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, and The Next Generation, please stop making these movies, Candyman 2 and 3, The Mangler, The Haunting, Congo, Thinner, The Island of Dr. Moreau, Alien Resurrection, I like 3, but it's got a difficult reputation, An American Werewolf in Paris, and Spawn. Not to mention the absolute river of shit that is a non-stop parade of Leprechaun, Amityville, and Puppet Master sequels. It's undeniable that horror trends are shaped by cultural fears. The Cold War and space race of the 60s brought sci-fi and invasion terror. The growth of suburbia, rise of serial killers, and the AIDS epidemic in the 80s bolstered the slasher and body horror. But what did horror in the 90s speak to? Crime rates in the US had fallen, but America seemed to have a greater obsession than ever with crime. Jeffrey Dahmer, OJ Simpson, the Menendez brothers, the Oklahoma City bombing, and more were all over TV. And yet they never fully translated into horror, but instead found their cinematic equal in the crime thriller. The killer of the 90s wasn't an icon that audiences could root for over the span of multiple movies, but instead a more banal everyday evil. But more on that in a minute. Everything changed in 1996 with Scream, and it should come as no surprise that Wes Craven and Kevin Williamson's genre-aware slasher should be seen as the defining horror of the decade. It's just that it came in the second half of the period. Craven's New Nightmare was the director's first meta-commentary on the horror genre, but it was Scream that truly caught on with audiences, and it's both a timeless reflection of the slasher and extremely of its moment. You really can't take Scream out of 1996 without losing its appeal. The movie was such a success that it not only spawned a sequel less than a year later, but also reconfigured the perceptions of horror movies once again. Like I said, studios go where audiences demand, and this time, the late 90s resurgence of the slasher was more self-aware, and was just as much about TV-style teen drama and TV stars as it was about horror scares. The result was both old and new franchises working to fit into the mold made by Scream, 
I Know What You Did Last Summer, Bride of Chucky, Halloween H2O, The Faculty, Urban Legend, Disturbing Behavior, Idle Hands, Final Destination, Cherry Falls, Valentine, and a whole lot more that reached into the early 2000s. The thing is, I don't know how many of these would be classified as truly great horror. They do, however, have a discernible identity, and together create a more cohesive group than anything else during the decade. The Columbine High School shooting in 1999 did, however, disrupt this trend. The tragic events caused Dimension Films to cut out most of the violence in Scream 3, and you can see the post-Scream slasher cut way back on violence in favor of generic scares. The end of the 90s also brought about the beginning of the J-horror boom, with Perfect Blue in 1997, Ring in 1998, and Audition in 1999. It's a movement that would really take hold in Japan and the US in the 2000s, but its roots are in the 90s, with the advent of the internet and a growing feeling of isolation playing major roles in this new wave of horror. A stark contrast to the imminent physical threats of the 90s. If the last several years of studios, critics, and even fans buying into the idea of elevated horror has taught us anything, it's that there's always been a stigma around the horror genre that people try to bypass to gain mainstream acceptance, especially when in search of awards. You can see this come to the forefront in the 90s when studios backed away from traditional horror fare and instead embraced the prestige thriller. The 80s had cultivated a major conservative backlash to horror in the form of the Video Nasties label in the UK, which was codified by the Video Recordings Act of 1984, and the combination of major censoring and moral outrage in the US, with the satanic panic blaming horror for the moral degradation of kids. US moral outrage had somewhat died down in the 90s, but the Video Nasty remained in full swing, with Child's Play 3 in particular banned and wrong wrongfully blamed for inspiring murder. In any case, studios were less likely to embrace the horror label and everything that came with it. But the true change was sparked by Jonathan Demme's adaptation of Silence of the Lambs in 1991. Based on Thomas Harris's second Hannibal Lecter novel, Demme's movie was presented as a crime thriller more than a horror film. But you only have to watch the thing to know that this is horror. When compared to Michael Mann's Manhunter from 1986, based on Harris's first novel, the distinction is even more apparent. Where Manhunter was focused on procedural work in clean, stark spaces, Lambs is filled with dungeon-like prisons and dank, dirty basements. The grisly attacks put on screen where Manhunter hid them from view. But even so, the presentation of Lambs to critics and awards voters insisted it wasn't a horror movie, and the campaign was a huge success, becoming the third film in history to win the Big Five Academy Awards and the fourth highest grossing movie of the year with $130 million. In its wake, the path to critical and commercial success was clear. Give audiences horror thrills, but package them as a thriller. Everything from basic instinct to cape fear to single white female to the hand that rocks the cradle to primal fear to pacific heights to fallen to kiss the girls to the sixth sense to the bone collector work to be seen as a thriller while often containing every element of horror. Decades later, M. Night Shyamalan would insist that he doesn't direct horror movies and that The Sixth Sense was not horror but a classic psychological thriller. Not only that, but the crime procedural in general exploded across both film and TV, and it's never really stopped. In some ways, you could blame the modern glut of true crime podcasts, where people with no credentials try to get some fame by unraveling a crime they have no business being involved in, on Silence of the Lambs. The true crime story is itself horror, exposing audiences to terrifying ideas in a way to help them live out their fears in a safe and controlled way. And yet, all of these tried to rebuke the label. Whatever your opinions on these films genre classifications may be, what's important is that movie studios and the creators they hired were becoming horror averse, trying to avoid the genre that had dominated the 80s and had often been seen as second class. When studios did decide to put their money behind horror, it was in search of prestige as well. It all started with Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula in 1992. That's a lot of possessives. Its high budget of $40 million brought major critical acclaim for its production and design. An air of esteem, three Academy Award wins, and $215 million at the box office. Say what you will about some of the acting, 
but the practical effects and cinematography are excellent. This began a mini boom of prestige horror and new adaptations. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Interview with the Vampire, and Wolf in 1994. Gus Van Zandt's extremely misguided Psycho remake in 1998, and Sleepy Hollow in 1999. Decades later, and more people are willing to call these horror, but that studio bias still makes it easy for people to find some sort of distinction between high and low art, to make themselves feel better. For all this talk of the good and bad of horror, it's easy to get lost in the negativity of where the genre went in this strange time. But there are great horror movies found throughout the decade that everyone should watch. 1990 brought Child's Play 2, a film I see as one of the best examples of a horror sequel. Misery adapted Stephen King's commentary on fandom and addiction with two powerhouse performances. Arachnophobia is a very fun take on the creature feature. Exorcist 3 had William Peter Blatty adapt his sequel book for a movie that has old school drama and more modern scares. Tremors is one of the great monster movies, using every trick in the book to bring the graboids to life and a perfectly constructed movie. 1991 brought Silence of the Lambs, a great piece of crime horror, but it's the horror of Clarice Starling stuck in a world of men who either dismiss her or use her that's the scariest aspect. Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs brought a more class-conscious approach to horror as the start of Craven's resurgence. The Addams Family updated the classic TV series for today with a great cast. Not exactly horror, but more horror-flavored comedy. 1992 saw Francis Ford Coppola dabble with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Candyman collide urban legends with modern social issues. Army of Darkness pushed the Evil Dead franchise into medieval silliness. Alien 3 bring the franchise to its darkest entry for better and worse. And Fire Walk With Me let David Lynch embrace the horror of Twin Peaks. 1993's best works are family friendly, with the even better Adam's Family Values, the stop motion Nightmare Before Christmas, and the Halloween staple of Hocus Pocus. 1994 had the Anne Rice drama interview with the vampire, Wes Craven's meta New Nightmare brought Freddy's saga to a close, and John Carpenter commented on both Lovecraft and King with In the Mouth of Madness. 1995 is maybe the weakest year, but Species is fun. Tales from the Hood is the rare black horror of the time, and Seven, while trying to be a prestige crime thriller, is the most horror-focused of this subgenre. 1996 of course has Scream, but the half-and-half -half crime and vampires of From Dusk Till Dawn is really unique, and The Frighteners brought Peter Jackson's horror to the United States. There's also Gamera 2, Gamera retrospective coming soon, but its kaiju focus has more horror flavoring than being outright horror. 1997 brings the sequel commentary of Scream 2, the sci-fi hell horror of Event Horizon, and the low-budget closed space escape of Cube. 1998 is a pretty mixed bag, but I think H2O is a much-needed, if weirdly sleepy, recovery for the Halloween franchise and Blade, while an action-heavy comic book adaptation is still a horror movie. All you have to watch is that awesome opening blood rave to know that's true. And 1999 brings us Takashi Miike's messed up audition, the big-budget adventure remake of The Mummy, the fantastic Gamera 3, and the incredibly influential Blair Witch Project, which made $248 million worldwide and might define the 90s as much as Scream when seen in the long term. And while I've largely focused on feature films of the decade, I'd be dumb to not mention the mini boom in TV horror that was also happening. There's of course Hocus Pocus, but also the classic IT two-part miniseries, The Stand, and Halloween Town. All this alongside TV series like The X-Files, Are You Afraid of the Dark, Twin Peaks, Goosebumps, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and a lot more of The Thrived, which helped bring horror back into the mainstream. When I look back at the 90s, I see horror in a time of major change, but largely without a direction to go in. By the end of the decade, Scream had shown both creators and studios what was possible in a subgenre that audiences knew all too well, and made it safe for horror movies to interrogate themselves. But even then, the Scream imitation boom was short-lived. But that lack of true direction gave the decade something I really loved incredible variety that prevented homogenization that can sometimes hurt horror. Everybody was in search of the next big hit, but when the formula isn't clear, you get big and weird swings. Decades later and we can see the 90s as the time when horror was more willing to be self-aware, the date when the horror franchise couldn't cut it beyond VHS, the age when the horror masters all declined in skill and success, 
the era when studios put their weight and money behind the prestige thriller, and a moment when we glimpse the foreign horror and found footage boom to come. So, was horror in the 90s really that bad? I don't think so. But it was a time with more disappointments than genre classics, and even then, those classics often lacked the breakthrough success of decades both past and future. Today, the 90s stands as a strange, lost, but important time in horror history, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Thanks for watching today's video and happy Halloween! This is a very different type of video for me and I hope you enjoyed this change of pace when it comes to the Halloween coverage this season. The 1990s are a fascinating time for horror because, as I discussed, they feel like a directionless era. But there are a lot of great movies that were made during the time. It's just that whenever I see think pieces written about 90s horror, I often see a very negative outlook. But there's so many great horror movies that were made during the decade. There is, of course, a lot of trash also, but there are a lot of garbage horror movies that are made in every decade. And really garbage movies that are made all the time. That's just what happens when studios are constantly making stuff. So I wanted to take a look for myself and decide why this decade had the reputation that it had. And as you can see now that you've reached the end of the video, I think that the 90s had a lot of great stuff but definitely had a lot of dips in quality. So when I think you combine the decline of a lot of the great horror directors with studios wanting to distance themselves with the genre, you get a decade that had a major dip, especially around the midpoint. In the last several years, I've made videos that have covered a lot of different horror franchises that have gone throughout the 90s, like a video on Scream from several years ago, and my retrospectives on Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. But this gave me a chance to talk about the larger horror ecosystem. Of course, I could never talk about every movie in depth, because that would just take hours and hours and probably days actually. But I wanted to use this time to investigate the various trends that were happening during the 90s. And of course, the Scream boom itself is a subsection of this time. And really, I could do a video just on Scream-inspired slashers, which I might do at some point. I also wanted to give time for some positivity about the decade as well, because like I said, there's a lot of great movies that were made during the 90s. It's just that I think sometimes people look at them and divorce them from the decade they were made in, for whatever reason. I'd love to hear your thoughts on 90s horror, your favorite horror movies from the decade, your own personal favorite decade for horror, and your own thoughts on why the 90s has this sort of reputation. As well as any 90s franchises or individual films that I mentioned that you'd like to have a individual video made about. As always, a huge thank you to my patrons for their continued support. If you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive reviews. I'm continuing to put out weekly horror reviews for the Halloween season, and so far those have included reviews on Salem's Lot and Hellraiser. I'm doing a different movie from a different decade every week for Halloween. So until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and watching some great 90s horror. Happy Halloween!